Welcome to Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. The teaching application verse for this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I've never uh, never been wa- much of a, a person for running. Um, I, I, I'm somewhat athletic, but for some reason I've never really been much about about running, unless I was being chased. I guess in that case I, I could probably run pretty good. Problem with running is you know your coffee spills, right? So I. <laughs> but they, you know, in the in the Greek games, um, they had a race that was all very unusual. I mean, if you consider what what races are like today and, and what we think of as being a race, this wasn't quite like that. In this race, the winner was not the runner who finished first. The winner of the race was the one who finished with their torch still lit. I want to run all the way with, with my flame still lit for the Lord. Do you? It's not a matter of finishing first, but of finishing well. Whether it is in service to the Lord, in church attendance, in stewardship, in um, tithing or personal devotion time or some other aspect of this Christian life. Faithlessness is something that we cannot ignore because to do so is to our own detriment. Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. You know, Paul chose the example of a runner for illustrating this Christian life. But we cannot read that and come to the conclusion that it's okay for us to start out poorly and finish badly, or to start out strong and finish weak. In another place, Paul said, walk worthy of your vocation. And still in other places, like First and Second Timothy, he instructs us as good soldiers to fight the good fight of faith. In these exhortations from Paul, the Bible says first that there is a clear goal. Second, there is effort involved. Third, the goal may be reached or not reached. And fourth, the prize is valued. I think there are many Christians who have lost their fire because they think that that once you're saved, that's it. There's nothing else to it. And, And they may well have been taught that. Today's church culture is one of approval and acceptance over being challenged and with exhortation. Scripture makes it very clear 
that there is a target. There is something we are to aim at, and there is a race that is to be finished. Philippians 3 speaks of the security of the believer, but also the pursuit of the goal of the upward call in Christ. The goal that he speaks of in Philippians 3 is not salvation. We are saved out of judgment and into eternal life when we receive Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. And Jesus himself said that we cannot be snatched out of his hand. The goal is also not, well, the goal is not salvation. The goal is also not uh, Jesus Christ. In verse 12 of Philippians 3, the verse preceding Paul saying that he presses toward the goal, he says that Jesus already has laid hold of him. The goal that Paul speaks of is to be called upward to be with Christ. It's the end of the race, the finish line. This is why Paul tells us in chapter 1 of Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Every step that a runner takes is important. If that runner is to finish well. Think about it. To compromise on just one or two steps could result in a shameful finish. The race may be completed, but there will be shame at the finish line for having run the race half-hearted, carelessly, crossing with a torch that's extinguished. The great desire of any Christian is to finally be in the presence of our Lord. To hear those wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. After receiving God's grace, we all have a mission to participate in his grace. That our torch continues in its flame and that we finish well. Crossing the line with torches ablaze to receive the commendation of our king. As a runner commissioned to finish the race, don't allow yourself to be derailed from your mission. In today's study, we are going to recognize some things that Paul endured that could have derailed him from his mission, but didn't. We'll recognize those things and how Paul reacted to them, and we'll see what we can learn that will keep us from being derailed should we face difficulty, or hurdles along our race. Now, last week, we didn't take the time. We, we finished, uh, I think we got up maybe to verse 17 in Acts 21. So that's where we're going to pick it up today. But last week, we didn't really take the time, because there was so much in there last week. We didn't really take the time uh, to look at the historical background for our chapter, and I love to do that, and I, I don't want you guys to miss out on that, so we're going to take a few minutes to do that. Um, Paul penned two uh, letters, two of his epistles during the days of chapter 19. Those were the second letter to the Corinthians and the letter that he wrote to the newly arrived church in Rome. Now remember that instead of planning a church in Rome, Paul sent a church to Rome, and then he followed up with them by a letter. The letter to the Romans, it's unique among all the other epistles in Scripture. For one thing, it's, it's long. It's a long epistle. But for another, this letter, that letter of Romans, it contains, it contains everything that a Christian is going to experience in church life. For us today as well. Chapters 12 through 15 of Romans, they list every problem that the Gentile churches ever experienced in church life. Today, we experience these very same things that Paul talks about in that letter. From renewing the mind, to respecting authority, to maintaining unity. Letter to the Romans, it covers it all. And not much longer if we're going to be in that book. And can you tell I'm excited? I'm ready to get in that book. I love the letter to the Romans. Now, after penning that letter, 
and sending it on to the church with Phoebe. Paul and his eight companions, they headed for Jerusalem. Now, Israel at that time was reaching a boiling point. The governor, Felix, was struggling, and it was common knowledge that he was accepting bribes. Back in Rome, Nero was fed up with his domineering mother, Agrippina, and he would soon have her killed. In Israel, the Sicarii, or the dagger men, we've talked about them before, they were like, uh, like assassins who, who didn't like anybody who, who wasn't uh, zealot, a zealot for the law of Moses. These Sicarii, they, they weren't any more a secret society as they were before. They were now a political party, yet they continued. They continued to, to act with terror and, and murder. It was recognized that, that whoever made their hit list would soon be dead. Back in Corinth, Paul was on that hit list. And they had arrived in Corinth looking for Paul. Now the Christians, they had a plan. And they made it appear that Paul was on board a ship harbored in Corinth. That ship was headed for Troas. Paul was not on that ship. Instead, his eight companions were on board that ship. The Sicarii, they boarded that ship thinking Paul was there. And they wound up stuck on that ship for that whole uh, ride across Meanwhile, Paul had stolen away with Luke out of Corinth, and they had walked to Philippi. This meant that the Sicarii now had seen Paul's eight companions, though, six of whom were Gentiles, including this Ephesian named Trophimus. Now, the Gentile companion of Paul would later be recognized. Trophimus would later be, in fact, in our chapter, we'll see where, where they mistake i should say mistakenly recognized as being with paul we'll see that um the sicarii while they were on the ship here with these eight companions apparently they must have really there must have been something about trophimus that really stuck out uh, about him to them so because they would remember what he looked like now from philippi in july of 58 a.d paul took a ship to troas where he met up with the eight and it's interesting to note that luke tells us that it took five days to cross the Aegean Sea to reach Troas, it should have only taken two. That may indicate a fourth shipwreck, which Paul endured. You know, Paul endured a whole lot during his uh, different missionary journeys. I mean, some really tough stuff. You guys remember he was stoned with rocks and dragged outside of the city and left for dead? What did he do? He got back up and walked back into the city. Other times there were riots caused by the stuff that he taught. People were angry at him, mad at him. They tried to beat him and kill him. They imprisoned him. And then also these shipwrecks. You know, Christians these days, including myself, we've become so tender. You know, all all it takes for us to to get derailed from, from our mission from our christian walk is to be unfriended on facebook you know but paul man he had so many setbacks that he, that that happened as he was following the holy spirit but you know it, it's interesting when we when we read about his actions here in Acts and the things that he did and how he met these setbacks, we realize that, that Paul, he just never seemed to doubt. It's like he always had that feeling, you know, I know that I'm following the leading of the Holy Spirit. So last week, you know, our goal was to learn from Paul's example how to discern between the thoughtful and the sincere counsel of friends and, and uh, between God, the sincere counsel of friends and God's will in the case that they don't intersect. Many times they do intersect. This week, we're going to consider how to guard against being derailed from our mission. And the very first thing we want to talk about here, even actually before we get into the chapter, is doubt will derail you. Doubt will derail you. 
don't let doubts derail you from your mission. You know, shipwrecks happen. Paul spent a lot of time on ships. It only makes sense that he would experience some shipwrecks. And he could have looked at those shipwrecks and said, well, wow, this is too dangerous. He could have assumed, oh, I must be walking outside God's will. But he didn't. There are things that happen to everyone, and then there are things that happen to those people who are in the race. Now, had Paul not been on fire for Jesus, he wouldn't have experienced these shipwrecks. And if you're living your life for Christ with gusto, doing all that God gives you the opportunity to do, then you're going to face setbacks. You know, those, those who don't run in the race, they don't have to worry about tripping and falling. They don't have to worry about spraining their ankle. They don't have to worry about running so hard that they're out of breath. It's only those who are actually in the race, who are participating in the grace of God, who are living out their faith. Those are the ones who will experience setbacks. Those are the ones who will need to know that, that, hey, we don't have to listen to the doubts that are in our minds. If we're in that race, we're in God's will. We're following the lead of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes I, I think setbacks are kind of like the evidence. <laughs> you know, we tend to think of it as being setbacks as being the evidence that, oh, we've done something wrong. But many times I think setbacks are evidence that, you know, we're, we're walking, we're running that race. We're in there, and, and Satan wants to trip us up. And he, if we weren't in the race, he wouldn't want to trip us up. There's other people that he could be trying to trip up. Now, continuing on their journey, they sailed to Miletus, and Paul and Luke may have actually walked the 320 miles while those eight again took the ship in order to confuse the Sicarii that were out to get Paul. Leaving Meletus, Paul went on to Ptolemais, then to Caesarea by the sea with Luke and the other eight alongside him. Now, at this point, it was May of 58 AD, and both Paul and Nero had only 10 years left to live. Felix, the governor of Israel, had two years left in which to, he would serve in that office. Paul would... Here in just a few short verses, Paul becomes a part of those last two years of Felix's time in office. And so last week we left off, I think, with verse 15. So let's let's start. Yeah, let's start there and we'll we'll dig it in from there. So Acts 21, starting verse 15. It says, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. Well, let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would open your word up to our hearts this morning, open our hearts up to your word, and speak to us right where we are. Um, Lord, there's maybe we have doubt in our heads. Maybe uh, we have been hitting setbacks, Lord, we ask that you would encourage us through your word this morning, that you would exhort us through your word, that we would be doers of your word, not hearers only. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. So the trip from Caesarea by the sea to Jerusalem, it was about 50 miles. That was a long trip back in those days, but Paul, you know, Paul went on some really long trips. He went on some long journeys, and so this was probably nothing to Paul, these last 50 miles. Let's be reminded here that the Christian walk is made up of long routes. It's made up of short routes, but there are no shortcuts, at least not for the Christian who wants to finish well. We don't cut corners. We don't divert from the path for an alternative route, and close enough is not okay. That's because 
Well, that is not because God's grace is exhaustible. We're not going to, you know, be in the presence of the Lord, and he's, he's not going to say, sorry, my grace ran out. Not enough for you now. That's not going to happen. He's not going to say, oh, you used it all up. Sorry. It's because of undeserved grace that we magnify the Lord and that we please him, we desire to please him by running the race well. Now, I've heard it said that the longest way to go is often a shortcut. Um, and I experienced this <laughs> one time. Uh, actually, I've probably experienced it many times. But I, I one time, st- it just sticks out distinctly in my mind when I was in college. And we were, me and a, a group of, of people with the uh, College of Anthropology there, um, we, we were on our way up to a, a conference in Kentucky. And, of course, we looked at a map. And we didn't have, you know, these at that time. So we looked at a map, and we looked at, at the routes, and we thought, well, we could go this way, but that really seems way out of our way. We could go this way, but hey, that's look at that middle way. It runs right up there, the Natchez Trace. That trip should have only taken us seven hours. It was more like 12. The Natchez Trace is a public parkway. Um, and the speed limit is like 35 the whole way. <laughs> and once we were on it, man, it took forever. Wasn't a shortcut. What we thought was a shortcut wasn't a shortcut. And you would think that we had learned our lesson on that. But on the way back, we looked at the map. And I'm not sure how we did it. But somehow we ended up going back through Atlanta. I don't know how. (laughs) I have no clue. Tennessee, it was the shortcut was not a shortcut. I found out in high school that while a calculator may be the easiest way to find the solution, it's also the longest way to passing the class. That's because you don't learn how to do the math. A runner doesn't just one day decide to run a marathon. Now, there's months, if not years, of practice, training. In the same way, if we cut corners in our Christian life, we will not run well. Shortcuts will derail you. If we're going to run well in our Christian life, then we need to commit ourselves to live out our Christianity well. That means habitually doing those things that strengthen ourselves to live out our Christianity well. What are those things? That's what I talk about a whole lot. Devotion time, prayer time, church, serving, tithing, worship. Bible study that challenges, Bible study that exhorts, that confronts, rather than Bible study that entertains. These are the habits of Christians who are living out their faith well. Now, Paul said this about his training in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, but I buffet my body and bring it into bondage, lest by any means after that I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. That, that is buffet. That's not buffet. You didn't buffet his body. In other words, Paul says that he disciplines himself so that he should be so that he should be doing or that what he does becomes habitual rather than the exception. Right? So that you can look at his life and see that the things that he was telling as he exhorted the, these Ephesian elders back in chapter 20. And he said, you know how I lived when I was among you, teaching. What Paul said was what Paul did. And it was habitual to him. Those things that Paul taught were not the exception to the rule. Those were the rule in his life. He did those things. And other people saw that in his life, saw the consistency. And that's why he was able to say later, hey, You know what? Follow me as I follow Christ. 
Traveling with Paul were, were Luke and the eight, but they were joined by some other disciples from Caesarea, including Mason. Now, Mason was originally from Cyprus, and now he was living in Jerusalem, and he would actually host Paul and the gang during their visit. Now, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, it marks the end of his missionary journeys as recorded in Acts. And the remainder of Acts is going to detail Paul's arrest, his trial, his journey to Rome, which involves another shipwreck, trial, and imprisonment there. Verse 17 says, And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. So upon his arrival in Jerusalem, Paul met with the leaders of the church there, and he reported to them, and the language actually indicates there that that he didn't just tell them kind of in general. He went through specifics of all that had happened during his missionary journey. So he was very specific in everything that he told them. They knew everything that had happened. They heard about all the Gentiles that had come to, to receive Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, the churches that had been planted, all these amazing things that the Lord had done through Paul's ministry. I mean, Paul had been used to bring the gospel to so many. And though there had been setbacks, delays, frustrations, even shipwrecks, beatings, and riots, it was very clear that God had blessed Paul's ministry. Multitudes had been saved. Many churches had been planted. Paul had even sent a church to Rome. On the other hand, the Jerusalem church, though they had an auspicious beginning, they had struggled since that time. And after Paul described to them all that God had done in his work, they respond in this way. They say, well, that's great, but look here at all the Jews that have believed, and they are zealous for the law. The Jerusalem leaders, they were thankful and happy for what God had done among the Gentiles. But we get the sense that while they were listening to Paul, they were feeling envious. Not jealous, but envious. And so while they were glad to hear of Paul's success, they insinuated that there was something different maybe even lacking, that being that the Jews in Jerusalem were zealous for the law. Now, remember that there had been, I mean, we're, we're past the time of the Jerusalem council, right? Where they, they had said, you know, we don't need to place these burdens on the Gentiles except for those three things at the end. Well, it seems that, that they must have, the Jewish leaders must have kind of maybe forgotten a little bit about that. Or maybe they actually had some, some preference for, uh, for the church that they were pastoring as opposed to the church that, or the churches that Paul was planning. Whatever the case, we can see in their words that there was an underlying envy there. Now, many commentaries brush right past this, don't comment on the underlying sentiment. But a sound reading here reveals that while the leaders of the Jerusalem church say they the Christian Jews in Jerusalem. It is more like we have heard that you teach Jews to abandon the law, insinuating that there is something wrong with the work Paul has done. Otherwise, the leaders of the Jerusalem church should have been able to communicate that what they had heard as gossip and rumor was not in fact, the truth. So what's going to happen here is they're going to present Saul, or Paul, excuse me, Paul with a solution. And they say that the solution that they present him with will demonstrate to all the believing Jews, as well as also the unbelieving Jews there in Jerusalem, that Paul does uphold the law. 
And I think also, I think they also thought that Paul's doing this would perhaps add some legitimacy to their own ministry. Now, we need to understand that even within churches, there are differences in flavor. Some churches lean more toward charismatic things. Others lean more toward foundational doctrine. Some lean more toward righteousness and living, while others lean more toward grace and liberty. Some churches are better at making converts, while others are better at discipleship. Some at teaching the milk of the word, and some at teaching the meat of the word. We should never be envious of what God is doing or how God is using another church body, what God is doing through another church body. And except where there is false teaching or perhaps some doctrinal error, there's no reason to compare churches in a way that says they should be doing exactly what we are doing. That's not to say that we should not be jealous for the preservation and teaching of right doctrine. Willing to identify false teaching and where it is found, counter it. There's a distinction between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is the fear that something which we possess will be taken away by another person. And although jealousy can apply to our jobs, our possessions, even our reputations, the word more often refers to anxiety which comes when we are afraid that the affections of a loved one might be lost to a rival. We fear that our spouse or perhaps we fear that our children will be lured away by some other person who when compared to us seems to be more attractive, capable, or successful. Parents should be jealous for the affections of their children. Husbands should be jealous for the affections of their wives and wives for their husbands. Pastors should be jealous for their flock and protect them and shepherd them. Christians should be jealous for the good reputation of our Lord Jesus and live lives so that lives that magnify his good name among men. God is jealous for the affections of his people, which are so often stolen away by idolatry. On the other hand, to envy is to want something which belongs to another person. We might be envious toward a person for their possessions or for their job or, or their bass guitar or, or whatever the case may be. I've never experienced that, but if y'all are feeling convicted. Envy might even extend toward a person for, for the calling God has on their life or for what they have achieved in ministry. Envy will derail you. Don't be envious of the fruit of another person's calling or of their spiritual gifts or, or their talent. of their ministry unto the Lord. The religious leaders who despised Jesus did so because of envy, and they missed their Messiah. Envy towards someone for their ministry can cause you to neglect or even miss your own calling. I've got three stories I want to share with you guys. They're short stories, don't worry. Three stories. One of them is actually true. Um, you'll probably be able to figure out which one that is. The first one features a farmer who lived right next door to another farmer. And every morning he would go out onto his front porch and he would look out over his fields and then he would look out over the fields of his neighbor and he would pick out all the things that his neighbor was doing wrong and this became a habit, and every morning he would get up and he would look out at his neighbor's yard and he would criticize, well, he's doing this wrong, he's doing that wrong, he shouldn't be doing it this way, he should be doing it this way. 
And then one morning he walked out on his porch to look across and his neighbor was harvesting the crops. And he looked back on his and realized he hadn't even planted his own. The next story is in regards to an eagle, an envious eagle. I don't know how often en- eagles are envious, but let's suppose <laughs> for the sake of this story that this eagle is envious. And this eagle is envious of another eagle. That eagle could fly like nobody's business. There wasn't a mouse or rabbit safe within 10 miles of this eagle. So he could get so up, so high up in the air that he could see everything around him. He never went hungry. The other eagle was envious. He couldn't fly as well. There were days when he went without food. And one day, he, he was perched on a branch and he happened to look over and he saw a hunter in the woods. And we're presupposing now that eagles can talk. The eagle said to the hunter, he said, you see the eagle up there? Why don't you shoot him down? The hunter said, well, I would, but I need a feather for my arrow. So the eagle plucked one of his feathers out and gave it to the hunter. And the hunter placed it on his arrow, pulled the string back and shot, didn't go far enough. The eagle said, hey, you got to try again. So he pulled out another feather, gave it to the, the hunter. And the hunter again shot another arrow and missed. The eagle was flying way too high up in the air for his arrows to hit. But he kept trying. He kept going. He didn't give up. And the, the envious eagle didn't give up either until suddenly he realized that all his own feathers were gone. At that point, the hunter just turned around and killed him. The thir- third story is in regards to a very famous pastor from a while back, F.B. Myers. He drew some really large crowds. I mean, people came from miles around to hear him speak. And then one day, G. Morgan Campbell, another very famous pastor, was in the same town as he And all those crowds disappeared. And they went over to hear Mr. Campbell preach. Meyer, he confessed later that he was at first very envious. And he wrote about this. And he said, the only way that I was able to conquer my feelings was to pray for Morgan daily which I did. My friends, there is no there is no greater temptation of Christians than to be envious. Many of the things that we see going on within Christian circles that shouldn't be happening originate with envy. We should never be envious of what God is doing through other Christians. Barring the, the, you know, the identification of, of false teaching or heresy or, or discerning bad fruit, if we use our time being envious of others, we may forget to plant our own crops. And we may feather the devil's arrows until we become the victim. You know, we should have 2020 vision, as in John 2020, which says, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Instead, we often have 2121 vision, as in John 2121. But, Lord, what about this man? Jesus, he tells us, What is that to you? You follow me. Verse 21 says, but, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews for, who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they 
ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. There may have been a certain amount of envy, but there was there wasn't any ill will between Jeru- between that leadership of the Jerusalem church and Paul. However, there was a problem. The Christian Jews in Jerusalem, they were concerned that Paul opposed them continuing in their Jewish customs. Now, that was certainly not the case. Paul had desired to come to Jerusalem uh, for the reason of observing the Feast of Shavuot, the second of the pilgrimage feast. Nonetheless, the leaders of Jerusalem church, they decided that Paul's presence in Jerusalem would need to be managed so that Christian Jews would see that he did not teach the Jews to forsake Moses or ignore Jewish customs. Now, Paul did, in fact, teach that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes in Romans 10.4. But the Greek word there, telos, translated as end, it's better rendered purpose or goal. So the law leads up to him who is the fulfillment of its types. And in him, the purpose which it was designed to accomplish is fulfilled. That is, the purpose of the law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That is why Paul wrote, the law was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It's not the works of the law that save. It's the fulfillment of the law, and that is Christ Jesus. A person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even as Ephesians 2 tells us that we are saved by grace and not by works. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that. Verse 10 goes on to say, though, that we are created for good works that God has planned beforehand, that we should walk in them. So then we are not saved from works. We are saved by grace to works, not to the glorification of the works or to the glorification of self doing the works, but the magnification of God. Because it is only by grace that our works can glorify God. Exaltation of works will derail you. It's one thing to exalt good works over bad works. It's quite another to exalt works over grace. That can happen when we convince ourselves that because we do this, because we do that, or because we don't do this, or because we don't do that, that we are meriting salvation. It's quite possible to begin to think of things in the wrong order. I please God, therefore I am saved. But grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Undeserved and unmerited favor. Therefore, the order has to be, I am saved, therefore I please God. It cannot be the other way around. Grace has to be first, because the Bible says that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. There are church-going people who will tell you that they are going to heaven because they go to church. They're wrong. There are church leaders that will say they are saved because of what they do. And they are wrong. The danger of exalting works is that it quickly leads to wrong understanding of the order of works, which can lead to the deception of salvation by works. We are called to good works and should be doing be doing works we've been called into the lord's rest but the idle man doesn't know how to experience god's rest nor can he enjoy it verse 23 says therefore do what we tell you we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and purify take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that may, they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe 
We have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the, the, ex, to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So the, the Christian brethren in Jerusalem thought they had this perfect plan that would satisfy not only those of the church, but all the people of Jerusalem, saved or unsaved. And, and frankly, I find it kind of shocking that Paul would agree to this. And, and I have to wonder, you know, how Peter, if Peter <laughs> was there and saw Paul agreeing to this, how Peter would have responded. Because remember back in Galatians, how, how when Peter... In, at the church in Antioch, how he went and sat down at the table with the with the the Jews, got up from a Gentile table, went down and sat down at the table of the Jews, um, and began acting as if he was uh, under the law again. And, and Paul called him out on it in front of everyone. I wonder if, if Peter had been there, and he he was probably biting his tongue. I can't imagine. There are a lot of, of people who think that, that Paul actually made a, a pretty bad compromise by doing this. And, and I actually, I tend to agree with them. The Bible seems to be silent, though, on, on whether Paul should or should not have done this. And we're going to see in the next few verses, though, that it does not go well for him. Now, later, we will find that the Lord stood beside Paul in prison and said to him, you testified well of me in Jerusalem, you shall also testify of me in Rome. Paul made a, may have made a mistake by agreeing to do what the Jerusalem church asked of him, but whether or not Paul should have or shouldn't have, the Lord would use it for his good purposes. In other words, this was all in God's hands. Assuming that it's all up to you will derail you. The Bible says that God chooses the foolish and the weak things. That we are not sufficient in ourselves and that God has given us everything we need for godly life. It says that our sufficiency is in him and that through him we can accomplish great things. It says that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. God has set us up for success by justifying us, by filling us with the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit, and giving us eternal life. He doesn't even expect us to do the job by our own power, but by the power that he supplies. Now because it all depends on God, there's no room for self-importance or pride. And so the load can be shared among one another. We can trust God with our lives, even when we make a misstep. You know, God may expect us to walk in those good works that he planned before, before us, the, the duties may be ours, but the events are his. So there's nothing left for us to do but seek how we might be approved of him, confident of his providence over us, for there's no situation that you can get into that God cannot use. I remember... Uh, when I was living in North Carolina, uh, I don't remember how old Nathan was. Joshua wasn't born yet, but he maybe two, maybe a little older than that. I don't remember. Um, but we had a, a front porch, and I was out in the front yard, and he was on that porch, and um, he he was. See, you forget the ages of of the children as they grow up when they started walking, when they started. But at this point, he was he was kind of walking. Um, he was jumping, and we had been playing this game in the house where he would jump off the couch into my arms, and I would catch him, you know. Well, we were out there in the in the yard, and I had my back turned to him. He was on the on the porch, and suddenly I heard I hear this, "Catch me, Daddy!" <laughs> and, and there I am doing acrobatics, trying to get around, turn around to catch him. I managed to catch him. He jumps, 
before I was even turned around. And, and, and it's like, why did you do that? Why, why would you do that? Because you're my daddy. God's your father. So you can jump. Verse 27 says, Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people the law in this place. And furthermore, he has also brought Greeks or Gentiles into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city when they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed and the people ran together, seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut. All right, so remember that the temple was composed of several courts and, and working inwards toward the, from the outside toward the, the temple proper, fewer people were allowed in as you went into the different courts. There was the court of the Gentiles, and as you may have guessed, that was pretty much where anybody could be. There was the court, um, as you went further in, there was the court of the women. This was as far as the women could go. Then past the, the Nicanor gates, further in towards the, the temple, there was the court of the Israelites, followed by the court of the priests. Now, those men who had followed Paul in Asia Minor, seeking to kill him, who had, had seen the eight men who accompanied him, six of whom were Gentiles, saw Paul in the temple with a man who looked like Trophimus and accused Paul further of defiling the temple by bringing a Gentile where he was not allowed. Paul was innocent of all these charges, and the man that was with Paul was not Trophimus, but was one of the men that he had taken the vow with. And there was nothing really that Paul could have done here. He, he didn't do what they accused him of, and, and so he, he, didn't, he couldn't have anticipated that this was going to happen, that, that they were going to say that Trophimus was with him when he, in fact, wasn't. Not being above accusation will derail you. Be very careful of what you do and aware of the situations you put yourself in. Satan is quite sly. And if he can put you in a situation or convince you to place yourself in a situation where you can be accused, he will do it. There have been many Christians derailed from ministry because they did not live life above accusation. Now, remember back in chapter 20, how Paul had said, as we talked about earlier, actually, Paul had said to the Ephesian elders, you know how I lived among you. Paul did his best to be above accusation in all things, even foregoing for himself what we would think as being Christian liberty. So that there was then no danger of the ministry being hurt by those who would throw accusations his way. Now, of course, no matter how much we try, sometimes we don't realize the way other people perceive something in our life. That's when we must have an understanding that we don't gossip, that we don't point fingers. Instead, we go to one another and abide in the manner in, in which Jesus detailed in Matthew 18. We don't just go around accusing. There's a lot of accusations that go on among Christians these days. But you know who the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren? It's the devil. church has been called the, or the Christian army has been called the only army that treats its own wounded. So often that's the case where somebody stumbles, they fall, and then the church turns their back on them. It's one of the things I really, really appreciated about Pastor Chuck's ministry. There are so many people who were in Christian leadership who stumbled and and, and 
Chuck, he didn't, he didn't point fingers at them. He didn't say, you're done here. Instead, he brought them in closer to him, and he would personally disciple them and restore them. Pastor Chuck's going to be missed by a lot of people. Now, what happened here, we can't fault Paul in, on this. Uh, there's just really no way he could have anticipated this happening. That being said, there are plenty of things that we can be wise about doing or not doing, which may or may not be wrong, but could give the appearance of doing wrong. You know, sometimes appearance is all it takes for fingers to be pointed and accusations to be made. Verse 30 says, And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw that the commander and the soldiers when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. They didn't even know what what they were accusing Paul of. So when he could not as, when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not, in, not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? That's that word Sicari again, by the way. But Paul said, I am, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no, ma- of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, that's a weird place for a chapter break. But nonetheless, that's where the chapter break falls. So their intention was to kill Paul. And if he survived the beating, then a stoning would have taken place. But the commander of the garrison received word about the uproar, and he took soldiers and his uh, his special ops team, the centurions, and he seized them, and he seized Paul. And having Paul in custody, he asked him who he was and what he had done. Because this multitude, they were so confused, they didn't even know what they were accusing Paul of. But the crowds, they were too loud for him to hear. They took Paul up to the barracks. They had to carry Paul because he had been beaten so badly. Now, surprised that Paul could speak Greek, the commander realized that his original assumption about Paul was wrong. And when he heard that Paul was a Jew from Tarsus, a citizen of the city which meant he was a Roman citizen, he permitted Paul to speak to the people. Now, Paul was going to share his testimony with these people, and we'll get to that next week. But you know what? We we look at this, and logic would say to us that he should have been at least angry with these people for what they did. He, He maybe even hated them for what they did. Yet, we're going to find next week Paul shares his testimony with these people. This is the final point for us. That is that anger will derail you. Anger will derail you. People will hurt you. People will make you angry. They'll do things that affect you negatively and pass it off as if it were nothing. Jesus warned us that you will be hated by everyone because of me. Why would the world hate you? Well, Jesus said, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. As ministers of the gospel, we have to understand 
that we are not called to return hate for hate or anger for anger. Think about it. The, the world in, in this context is everyone who needs Jesus. The very people that we are called to take the gospel to. But if we allow hatred or anger to rule over us because of mistreatment by the world, then we will be derailed from our mission to love God, to love others, taking the gospel into the world and making disciples of all the nations. Now, so when you find yourself getting irritated with someone, just give them a noogie and Indian burn. No, don't. Pray for them. Pray that God would give you the opportunity to minister the gospel to them, to share your testimony. And if you have anger, if you're feeling anger over it, then pray that God would settle your heart, that he would exchange the anger that you feel for love for the person that has caused you to feel angry. Jesus, he looked down from the cross at those who hated him. And he said, Father, forgive them. We too should forgive those who hate or hurt us. And instead of returning anger to them, we give them Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, for a challenging word. Lord, we want to grow in our walk. Lord, we want to um, we want to run the race well. We want to magnify you. We want you to be glorified by our lives. So, Lord, we place ourselves before you this morning. In some instances, we say, Lord, we know that you need to refine us more. There's work to be done. And Lord, even though we struggle against the work that you're doing, please continue in that work and please chisel these things away from my life so I can be pleasing to you, so that I can serve you without worry that that I'm able to be accused of something so that I can serve you without this feeling of anger towards those who have done me wrong Lord some of us here are saying here I am Lord use me Again, comes the chisel so that we can better serve you. So, Lord, refine us. If that means turning up the heat so that all the mess comes to the top and it can be scraped off, then, Lord, we ask that you do that. We want you to be able to look down on us and see your reflection. Lord, we thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. We thank you, Father, that while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Lord, there may be those here today who don't know you as their Lord and their Savior. There may be those who are watching the live feed or who will be listening to this podcast. and They don't know you as their Lord and their Savior. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So my friend, if that's you, please do not put that off. Lord, 
we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your amazing grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. Smile at you. May he give you his peace. His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. So God bless you guys. We'll continue our midweek through Numbers. We're getting towards the end of Numbers, so we're going to be moving into Deuteronomy, not in too distant future. Um, and of course, we're continuing through Acts. I look so forward to getting to the book of Romans. I think that's going to be awesome. Um, but God bless you guys. Have a great week.